State of Ohio v. Raymond Tenzing, B-15-03961. There are multiple different matters that we need to deal with today. First and foremost, we'll be addressing the objection of the Cincinnati Enquirer and the objection of Scripps Media Incorporated, WCPO-TV, to the court's entry dated November 4th, restricting public access to juror questionnaires and requests for a hearing to reconsider. Um, the court has received the following requests for juror information. On October 26th, the Enquirer emailed through um, its lawyer, Jack Greiner, uh, initiating a request to change camera positions. Those um, issues were already resolved. On November 1st of 2016, the Enquirer emailed a request from Sharon Coolidge for completed juror, juror questionnaires. On November 3rd of 16, WLWT emailed a request from Bill Hager requesting the list of jurors' names and home addresses. On November 4th of 16, WLWT emailed from Bill, Sh excuse me, Grant Schultz for completed juror questionnaires. On November 12th of 16, WXIX email request from Nicole Dahl requesting the names of all seated and alternate jurors. On November 4th of 16, WCPO left a voicemail request from Jim McCray requesting redacted juror questionnaires. And on November 4th of 16, the Enquirer email from Kevin Grasha requesting redacted juror questionnaires. Um, on the court's authority and its own motion and pursuant to Superintendent's Rule 45, I've called a hearing to rule on the limited issue on whether juror questionnaires and jurors' names and addresses um, would be made, released to the media outlets or other public records requesters that have made a written request to obtain copies of these questionnaires and the names and addresses. Since the court has called the hearing on its own motion, the court will begin with the evidence concerning the issue. Before I begin, is uh, Mr. Greiner present? Sure. Very good. Ms. Diaz? Yes, Very good. Come on forward. We'll make accommodations at the council table. It's sort of a four-party motion. Obviously, the state of Ohio and defense uh, is present as well, and they have a role in this hearing. Thank you, gentlemen. Right, as, as the uh, court has called this hearing, the court will call its witness, um, the bailiff, Mr. Timothy Knoll. Mr. Knoll, come on around here. I don't need to tell you about the microphone to make sure it's turned on. Before you take a seat, do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so if you got Please state your name, sir. Timothy Knoll, N O E L. Where do you work? Uh, Hamilton County Courthouse for Judge Shanahan. And what is your job title? Bailiff. Did you submit an affidavit in this case previously marked as Exhibit A? I did. And are the statements that you made in that affidavit true? Yes. Okay, Your Honor. I'll tell you why. Very good. The affidavit here said it's statements within the affidavit here said. Very good. Second, second. Okay. I'm sorry? The statements in the affidavit are in this what you're saying. Okay. Um, the Statements being offered in the affidavit are not offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted. We are not asking whether jurors were actually concerned or believed there was a risk of harm, but rather whether the statements were said. Admissible as verbal acts offered only to prove the fact that they were said, not the truth of the statements, and that's in direct accordance with Applegate versus Northwest Title Company. 2004, Ohio, 1465. Your Honor, can I ask uh, who is we? You said we are not asking? The court. So is the court offering this exhibit? Yes. Affidavit, the affidavit itself has been attached to the court's entry. And the court is going to make a decision on the evidence that the court is introducing. This is an unusual animal, isn't it? Objection. Very, the objection is noted. Objection as well, I would just like to reiterate Point made in both of our objections, 
The hearing was held at the soonest available time. Um, the court, and following up uh, questioning of the bailiff, Mr. Knoll, you were out of town recently, correct? Correct. When did you leave town? November 12th. And when did you return? Friday, I believe it was November 18th. Okay, and was court in progress this past week? No, it was not. Very good. Your Honor, yes. my point is that the hearing should have been held before the entries were put on and on November 4th, A, release a grain release redaction questionnaire, but the next entry was the entry sealing the questionnaires in their entirety according to the Ohio Supreme Court case law of the hearing as to whether sealing the three questionnaires or redacting them should have been held before the decision was made. That's my point. We should have had this hearing two weeks ago, before November 4th. Very good. I'll move your objection. Uh, the objection is overruled. Counsel for, um, <coughs> excuse me, the, um, again, that affidavit you signed and swore to it uh, before a notary, correct, Mr. Null? Yes. Very good. It has previously been filed? Yes. Very good. Nothing further from the state of this witness. Counsel for both parties for the outlet. Mr. Grant. Not taking your judgment. Yeah, no, you're fine for everything. Mr. Noel, uh, you indicate you work for the judge, is that correct? Yes. Who asked you to uh, prepare the affidavit? Um. I believe the judge did after I had stated all my all the concerns that the jurors have brought to my attention. Okay, the question was who asked? The judge did. Thank you. So was that uh, Judge Shanahan's direction? Yes. Yeah, I assume you, uh, you enjoy your position. You'd like to uh, uh, keep your, your, your boss happy as best you can? Yes. Uh, let me ask, do you have it in front of you? Yeah, no, I did not. Um, I you I'll hand you a copy of your affidavit. Is that the you prepared for action, Judge Shannon? Yes, it is. When did the judge ask you to prepare it? I don't recall. Just to list the concerns that the jurors have brought to my attention. Let me ask you to look at paragraph three. Uh, it begins, while performing my duties as bail. Do you see that? Yes. And then subsection A of paragraph three, it says at least seven to eight jurors expressed to me. Do you see that? Yes. What are the names of the jurors who express concern to you? I don't know their names offhand. Is there a way that you could check and find out? I could, but I, I honestly, I don't get into a personal relationship with the jurors. We have a list of the juror names. Do I have a list now? Do you have one available to you? No, I do not. Could you, could you get one? Is there one? That I, I don't know. You know, I have a list of the, the juror names you made available to Mr. Knoll. We don't have that document. We're certainly not going to create that document. Um, this hearing addresses the names and the addresses that are retained by the jury commissioner. Um, that, that is where, the, if there is a document that was just the jurors, then it would be retained by the jury commissioner. But again, this hearing is, a, is addressing the release of the names and the addresses of the, the jurors. Mr. Noll's affidavit quotes jurors and there are other subsections. And the only way that anyone could verify the accuracy and truthfulness uh, Mr. Knoll's testimony is to verify with those people. Uh, so I would respectfully request that either this testimony be stricken because it is hearsay and uh, for that reason, but also if uh, he has uh, wherewithal to tell me the names of the people who he talked to reportedly so that we can actually verify what they said, what he purports that they said, then uh, we ought to be able to do that. And if we can't do that, then this testimony should Testimony is not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted, just the fact that it was said. 
Well, it certainly is being introduced for the truth of the matter asserted because the basis, at least one of the bases for the decision to redact the names was the jurors' concern for privacy. That is what is expressed in this affidavit. Uh, those statements are most certainly being introduced to prove that point. It is, it is textbook here, Sarah. If the court disagrees, objection is really no rule. Well, Your Honor, I am requesting that excuse to go ahead. The document does not exist. We do not have a document that lists these jurors' names and addresses present in this court. We don't retain that information. But it's available from the juror uh, commissioner, I think you said. It is. Okay, well, I request a re uh, recess so that uh, Mr. Knoll can retrieve a copy and answer the question. We are not going to recess to retrieve that copy because, again, this hearing addresses the release of jurors' personal identifiers, which includes their names and addresses. Well, this hearing now goes to his credibility uh, and his reliability, and then he's put that in issue. This court has put that in issue, and we would like the opportunity uh, to to verify what, what he said. We anticipated uh, that the hearsay objection would be sustained. Uh, the fact that it has not been, the fact that he is going to testify at this point about what other people have said to him opens the door to our ability to question those people to find out if he's telling the truth. So I would request a recess. Understood that your objection and request for recess is over. We'll proceed. Uh, with respect to subsection 3B of the affidavit, where you say if the juror of you have seen several jurors express concern, do you recall the names of any of those jurors? No. Would you have the ability to uh, identify those jurors if you had uh, documentation, appropriate documentation put before you? As I said before, I don't get into personal relationships with the jurors. I don't. If two of them had the same name, first name, I don't know which one's which. So you really can't tell me which jurors expressed concern? Not by name, no. Subsection C, if the viewer has seen one juror express concern, they might be photographed or recorded. Yes. Can you tell me the name of that juror? As I stated before, no. If appropriate documentation were put before you, could you tell me the name of that juror? As previously stated, no. Uh, section, paragraph 3D, while walking in the view of the scene when juror expressed concern, pointed out to me that a media representative was on the front porch. Can you tell me the name of that juror? No. If appropriate documentation were put in front of you, could you tell me the name of that juror? No. Do you have any uh, idea how we can verify the uh, truth or accuracy of what you're saying without knowing the names of these jurors? No. So we pretty much have to take your word for it? Yes. Uh, 3E, at the conclusion of the trial proceedings for the day, one juror expressed concern over media representative sitting next to the jury box with a laptop computer. Do you know the name of that juror? No, I do not. If appropriate documentation will put in front of you, would you tell me the name of that? No. So we have to take the word for that one as well, is that right? Yes. On November 2nd, uh, juror asked whether I was monitoring, whether I, referring to yourself, was monitoring the live stream. Uh, do you name the name of that juror? No, I do not. So if appropriate documentation will put in front of you, should you identify that juror? No. So we'll take your word for that too? Yes. Section 4, paragraph 4, while performing my duties as a bailiff, in escorting jurors in the above captain case, several jurors raised concern while in the presence of all the jurors about the potential that their names might be released. Uh, do you know the names of those jurors? No. If appropriate documentation were put in front of you, could you identify those jurors? No. We'll take the word for that as well. Is that right? Yes. Uh, did you inform uh, the jurors when they expressed that concern that there is a First Amendment right uh, of the public to access jury proceedings and that there uh, is no right for those jurors to have an expectation that their identities would not be exposed? I did not state that. Paragraph 5, while performing my duties as a ballot and escorting jurors in the above captain case, one juror asked the president of all the jurors whether there could be a juror questionnaire to be released. Juror expressed concern for your personal information. I can tell the name of that juror. No, I cannot. The appropriate documentation will put in front of you to identify that juror. No. 
So we'll just have to take your word for that. Anyway. Yes. No further questions. Yes. Uh, yes, I have a question. Uh, you testified that uh, the judge asked you to prepare your affidavit, correct? Yes. Did the judge help you write the affidavit? No, she did not. Did you, did anybody help you write the affidavit? Yes, I did. I had uh, the court administrator, Pat Dressing, did assist me. Did who? Mr. Landis. I don't know who Mr. Landis. Oh, the, no, no, he he just notarized it for me. Okay. You said Pat Dressing. Yes. Yes. Right, Yes. What was Mr. Dressing's role? So, for the legal terminology, I'm not a law student or did not go to law school, so. What legal terminology was that? Just the format of everything and the wording. Well, not I. Put, I stated everything that's on here. He helped write this all because I, as I said, I am not a law student. I did not go to cop, go to law school or any of that for this. Every statement in this affidavit came from out of your mouth. Yes, it did. Did anybody tell you what to say? No, they did not. Other than the jurors stating what's on here. And you agree that there's no way to verify that any of these jurors said what you say it said without us knowing their names? Correct. I object for the same reasons. I don't need to present duplicative or protection, but I object for the same reasons that the inquiry attorney objected. This, this uh, affidavit is top to bottom hearsay. No exception applies. Um, and it should be certain. All right. The objection is Matthews, any questions for Mr. Moore? No, Very good. Uh, Mr. Stevenson, no. Very good. Thank you, Ms. McDonald. The court has no further witnesses. Counsel for uh, the inquiry, Mr. Greiner, do you have any witnesses you care to call? I do. Ms. Diaz, do you? No, I do not, Mr. Matthews, do you? No, no. Mr. Stevenson, do you? Very good. Uh, legal argument, Mr. Greiner, Ms. Diaz, whoever wants to go first. Uh, Your Honor, there's a, there's, there's a couple of different uh, objections because there's a couple of different answers. With respect to the entry that was entered by the court subsequent to the entry uh, purporting to release redacted versions of the questionnaires. Again, there was an entry put on, it is time, or date stamp, November 7th, although I believe it was in, uh, discussed in court uh, on November 4th, uh, and a 14-page entry where the court made findings uh, that the questionnaires would be released in redacted form. Subsequent to that, an entry went on staying that entry and sealing uh, the questionnaires in their entirety. There were no on the record findings uh, with respect to the sealing order. And in fact, uh, the only on the record findings indicated that redacted questionnaires should be released. So the on record findings uh, completely undercut the notion of the, the order of sealing the records in their entirety. So the order of sealing the records in their entirety is, is invalid and void on its face because uh, there was no on the record findings uh, supporting the uh, sealing of, of the records in their entirety. That should, the first order of this court of business this morning should be to uh, vacate the order sealing the records in their entirety uh, because it was entered in violation of state XRL beating journal versus bond and the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. Um, so that, that should be order of business number one, we would expect that that would happen presently. Second, uh, with respect to the entry, the 14 page entry, uh, purporting to uh, limit production of the questionnaires only in redacted form, that being redactions of identifying information with respect to the jurors, 
uh, that entry is inadequate and does not satisfy uh, the requirements of state XRL, Beacon Journal versus Bond, or the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. Uh, the, the interest in the juror names uh, is set forth in the State XRL Beacon Journal uh, um, at paragraph 44. Uh, the interests that are uh, protected by release of juror information is to preserve fairness regarding the makeup of the juror pool, uh, to uncover potential juror bias or confusion, uh, to investigate the jury deliberations, the jury's reaction to evidence, potential misconduct by the jury. Moreover, uh, release of the juror names allows the public uh, and the media acting on behalf of the public to gain insight into any system-wide problems with respect to jury pool, jury selection. So these are all factors that the Ohio Supreme Court has noted uh, are advanced by release of jury information. Uh, so and, and for that reason, the presumption is that this information is public information. That is the rule. Anything less than that is the exception that needs to be justified. And we'll talk about why the justifications are deficient. But one other reason why, uh, at this point, the information should be released is we have had public statements by the prosecutor about his conversations with the jury. We have been told by the prosecutor, for example, what the vote was. We have been given uh, insight into what was going on in the jury room uh, amongst, among the jurors. But that's filtered through one of the advocates in this proceeding, the prosecutor. Uh, and therefore, if you're going to you know, uh, dribble out a little bit uh, only through the filter of the state, only through the filter of the prosecutor, that is in and of itself, I think, reason to permit the public and the media to follow up to find out if that information is accurate. It's very similar to Mr. Knowles' testimony. We just have to take his, his word for it today. We just have to take the prosecutor's word for it when he makes statements to the media. We ought to be entitled, I think the, the public has an absolute, I know the public has an absolute right to find out that information, to investigate that information on its own, not to rely on the state. We don't live in a government like that, where we rely just on what the government tells us. That's not democracy, that's not freedom. That's not, that's not a government that adheres to the First Amendment. That's why the public has a right to this information. It had it beforehand, it absolutely has it, uh, after statements are made telling us what the jury said, but only through the filter of one person, that's uh, and who happens to be the government. That is not what the First Amendment is all about. Uh, U.S. versus WEC uh, tells us the prospect of criminal justice being routinely meted out by unknown persons does not comport with democratic values of accountability and openness. That's why this information is critical. Now let's talk about what needs to be shown uh, to withhold the names. There has to be on the record findings and evidence that closure is essential to preserve higher values and that the, the route taken is narrowly tailored. Again, that tells us exactly why the subsequent entry staying the November 7th entry and completely sealing the records is inadequate. It's not narrowly tailored. Our redaction is at least there's an attempt to narrowly tailor. Total sealing the information in its entirety is not a narrow seal. And closer is not essential to preserve any higher value. Uh, the other justification for withholding the information is the fair trial issue. Uh, in that case, there needs to be on the record findings that there is a substantial probability of prejudice, not possibility, not maybe, not could happen, pro substantial probability of prejudice, and that reasonable alternatives to complete closure are inadequate. On those bases, uh, the court failed. And of course, the fair trial concerns are done. The trial's over, so, so about 50% of the entry is completely meaningless at this point. There is no issue with the fair trial with respect to these jurors, uh, with respect to this defendant. That trial's over. So that's completely mooted out, and that's, that's a good chunk of the justification for, uh, for the court's actions. The findings cannot be based on speculation. State Antiral Inquiry versus Sage, the Ohio Supreme Court told us, 
We cannot assume or speculate our way to the necessary findings. There must be some evidence in the record that speaks to the prejudicial impact. These findings have to be specific and not generic. The case that was cited in the entry by the court, U.S. versus Blagojevich, uh, says the court must find an unusual risk, and it is not sufficient to point to possibilities that are present in all cases. U.S. versus WEC, the case that I cited previously, conclusory and generic findings are insufficient. The case of NRA juror questionnaires from uh, tells us generalized concern regarding juror candor are insufficient. U.S. versus Bond's case, it is not enough to point to possibilities in every criminal trial to justify withholding the information. The cases that this court cited, uh, the, 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 the case that it cited primarily was U.S. versus uh, Cobritti uh, from the uh, uh, District Court in Michigan. Uh, was, a, was the first post-9-11 terrorism trial. Uh, and in that case, the court decided an anonymous jury was uh, appropriate. But two cases uh, subsequent to Kabuchi did not follow that holding, U.S. versus Oda and U.S. versus Mohammed. And in both cases, the courts noted that Kabuchi was, an, was a very much an outlier. It was the very first post-9-11 terrorism case. There was great concern about juror safety. Uh, and, and the court acted as it did. But again, subsequent cases by that same court has decided that it was not necessary. In U.S. versus Norwood, the court talked about what kind of specific findings are appropriate. Uh, and it gave some example. A dangerous defendant with, with ties to organized crime might be sufficient. A defendant who has a history of jury tampering, that might be sufficient ground or a dangerous and unscrupulous defendant with extensive uh, pretrial publicity. Well, certainly, there's no indication that Officer Tenzing has any ties with organized crime. There is no evidence that there's any history of jury tampering. Officer Tenzing has not been held out as a dangerous or unscrupulous defendant. The type of evidence that this court would need to point to that would be specific and not generic would be something along the lines of legitimate evidence that there was any attempt to, to interfere or tamper with the jury. Some evidence that there were threats made to the jury. Mr. Noel's affidavit is completely deficient because it's inadmissible hearsay, but even looking at the substance of it, it is merely, and in fact, the reason the court seems to think it's not hearsay is that it simply lets us know what the jury was thinking at the time. But it doesn't tell us if those concerns were rational. It doesn't tell us if there was any evidence that anybody tried to interfere with the jury prospects. Certainly, uh, the jurors selected for the trial, friends and neighbors, no doubt knew they were on this jury. There's no indication that any of those people uh, attempted to interfere or threaten the safety of these jurors. The, and, and we know from State HRL Beacon Journal versus Bond that certain identifying information is, is off with social security number, phone numbers, driver's license numbers. So there's no problem with redacting any of that information. Indeed, the case, the controlling case tells us that that should be, uh, that that should be redacted. So that's not the issue. But again, for this court to make the findings it made, there should be at least some evidence that these jurors were somehow approached uh, or that there was a probability that they would be approved. And there were no such findings. Every finding this court made, it made laid out primarily on page eight of its entry, is a generic, not specific finding. The word could reappears uh, quite a lot, as a matter of fact. It says here, uh, the broad privacy protections apply in all cases. So it's talking about a generic standard. It's talking about, uh, if you look at, at page four, so page four of the entry, the court is concerned about the possibility that any members of the public press or non-press would interact with the jurors. Well, that's a possibility. That's not a probability. And there's no evidence that anything like that happened uh, in ways that might invade the privacy of the jurors. That's a possibility. That's a speculation. Remember, the Supreme Court of Ohio told us, you can't speculate the way these findings are, but that's what this is. Uh, as with any high-profile case, 
So that's a generic concern. That's not specific to this case. Those are your words, Your Honor. The jurors could be approached or even harassed. Could is a possibility. It's not a probability. And there's no evidence here that anything like this happened or would have happened. The jurors could see their names or photographs in print. Again, a possibility at best. Uh, it's no, that's not evident. That is generalized, generic concern that we know from the case law we've cited is an inadequate basis for this finding. And we also, again, know the Ohio Supreme Court tells us, uh, State Act Charlie Park versus State, you can't speculate your way into these findings. There is no evidence in the record. Even if you admit the hearsay from, from Bail is null, at best, you come away with the idea that there were some jurors who were concerned about their privacy. That's it. We don't know if that was a reasonable concern. We don't know if there was any attempts to invade that privacy. We don't know that there were any efforts by people who knew they were on the jury to say, hey, what's going on uh, with the case? We just don't know. Again, and of course, we can't verify anything he said because uh, we can't have access to the juror names. We just have to take his word for it that they even said this. But again, even if we take his word for it and we accept that they said these things, it's insufficient. It doesn't constitute evidence. It tells us one thing. It tells us there were some jurors who were concerned about their privacy. That happens probably in every case, even if it's not a high-profile case. In, in very contested criminal cases, when there's potential gang activity, you think jurors aren't concerned about their privacy in those cases? Of course they are. But you need, Your Honor, to find that there's something different, there's something unique about this case. And that's not me telling you that. That's the standard. That's what is required. You can't speculate your way to it. And the entry uh, requiring redaction is speculation. That's all there is to it. Uh, it's insufficient on its face. Uh, so the, the entry sealing the uh, questionnaires in their entirety, there was no on the record finding supporting that decision. That's the that's way from the get-go. The decision redacting the questionnaires is not supported by the kind of evidence that is required to make such a finding. And for that reason, uh, the objection of the inquiry should be granted and the juror questionnaires should be released in under that. Well, thank you. Before you begin, Mr. Yes. Mr. Greiner, as it stands, what exactly is the inquirer asking for? Because as I previously outlined the various requests submitted by you, Ms. Coolidge, and Mr. Grasha, I then see in your client's uh, um, publications, uh, the Shanahan is not releasing the names of jurors in direct conflict with the Supreme Court. The editorial board believes that Shanahan prohibiting photos and videos of jurors during the trial violates the Ohio rules of superintendence. The crime victims and witnesses can object to being photographed, but that limitation does not extend to jurors. So now they're talking photographing and videotaping. Um, that access to jury information is, a, is not a privilege, it is a First Amendment right. And that Shanahan needs to assure transparency by releasing jury information finding ways to give public access on November 1st. November 2nd, jurors were ready to go at 9 a.m. for a planned view, but were delayed, alleging that somebody from Black Lives Matter threatened a video report jurors, taking no notice of the fact that the media was out there with their cameras rolling on the jurors. Saturday, November 5th, Enquirer withdraws its request for public records. That, in fact, never happened, despite it being printed. Um, the inquirer, which asked to see the questionnaires jurors filled out before the trial, withdrew its request after learning the jurors' concerns. This was printed by Dan Horn. The court received no withdrawal. Further, he went on to say that reporters sought the questionnaires not to publish the jurors' name, but to learn more about the men and women who will determine the outcome of one of the most important murder trials in Hamilton County history and were to take the inquirer's word on it that they won't publish the names, despite what happened in the Marcus Faisal, Liz Carroll case, where publishing the names of jurors was wrong, had to be printed by the editor at that time. Then on, let's see, November 8th, a juror is excused. No media outlet plans to name the jurors, including the inquirer. What 
does your client want? Right, that question is uh, irrelevant. I'll answer it, but it, it's not uh, relevant to these proceedings because I'll tell you why. These proceedings are about what is going to be the official record of the jury questionnaire, that whether that is going to be released at all or whether it's going to be released in redacted form, regardless of who makes the request. That's what, we're, that's what this is about. That entry was not specific to any particular requesting party. The effect of your entry, redacting names, is that the official public record of the juror questionnaires for anyone, for all time, is going to be, the names are going to be redacted. That's the objection. It's got nothing to do with any specific request that was made or not made. Uh, at the time the juror questionnaires were made, since this, this inquiry has been made of me, I will tell you what happened. Uh, the, uh, the request was made by one of our reporters uh, on a Thursday morning, which I believe was Thursday, November 3rd. I reached out to Mark Landis, who uh, is the court's uh, lawyer, if my understanding, for at least some of the, the proceedings here. And I suggested uh, to Mr. Landis that uh, the Enquirer would agree to accept redacted versions of the questionnaires uh, so that this did not become a distraction for the court or the trial. Uh, Mr. Landis indicated that uh, despite that offer, uh, he felt the court was going to put on an entry. Uh, I asked Mr. Uh, Landis if he would send the entry to me so I could look at it and, and perhaps comment and work with him on it. He declined to do so. Uh, the next day, it was Friday, November 4th, uh, this court indicated to the jury that the inquiry had uh, requested uh, the unredacted questionnaire and that the court, in the interest of the jury privacy, was going to put on an entry uh, redacting and identifying information. There was no, no disclosure to the jury that the inquiry had previously reached out uh, to the court uh, and offered to take the, uh, uh, the questionnaires in redacted form. Uh, there apparently was some um, uh, consternation uh, amongst jurors on that day. Uh, it is my understanding that uh, Bell was informed by the inquiry that to avoid the risk of a mistrial, uh, the inquiry would at that time withdraw its uh, request for the questionnaires. That was, that was an oral uh, statement that was made. I don't know that it was uh, put into writing, but it, but it stands so to suggest it. That, that, uh, that wasn't made is inaccurate, uh, and that's where we stand. But again, the objection, Your Honor, to the, uh, to the entry is, again, it is not specific with any requesting party. Your entry renders the jury questionnaires redacted, if, if at all. Your, your entry that superseded uh, the redaction entry is that they don't get released to anybody for any reason under any circumstances, with any redact anything, and they're just off limits to the public. Um, and, and again, that's void on its face. So, with respect, but with respect to the uh, order uh, redacting, uh, again, the, the objection is not really with respect to a specific request. Reject the, the objection is that your entry renders the official version of those questionnaires free of the jury names for all time to all people, to anybody who's interested in it, despite what the state, you know, despite what, what information the state releases about these jurors, or how they voted, or what they did, or what they were thinking. And so the effect of your entry and the effect of, of subsequent statements uh, by the prosecutor is that uh, the, the public is, is, is left with an incomplete picture and one that is filtered through the eyes of the government, which is, um, just a, a, a terrible, terrible uh, situation. That is not uh, how our open society is supposed to work. That is, that is completely contrary to the First Amendment. So I don't think that's a question. Don't interrupt and ask me to answer my question. I thought I did. You didn't. Point blank. Are you asking for the questionnaires redacted or unredacted? I'm asking for this court to set aside its entry uh, pursuant to our objection. The, uh, the questionnaires should be released in unredacted form or the court should make sufficient findings based on evidence, not based on speculation. And are you asking for, or are you not asking for the list of the jurors' names and home addresses? Uh, we, client? Our request was for the completed questionnaires that would include 
uh, that would include your names that, that would have redactions to the extent there's any social security number, telephone number, or driver uh, license information. So initially you want unredacted form, but you are now saying then social security and whatnot, but you want their, you want their names and addresses. Your Honor, we want the court, in the first instance, what we really want is for this court to properly apply state XRLB in journal versus bond, and whatever decision the court makes, make it on the basis of evidence. There is no evidence, so therefore the court should release the questionnaires and frankly should release the li any list of juror names uh, in unredacted form because the court, uh, has, there is no evidence in the record that would support anything less. So what we are asking for is that the court follow properly state XRL beef and journal versus bond. It has not up to this point. Okay, understood. For the record also, um, jurors chose to contact the prosecutor's office, correct? Yes. Did jurors also choose to contact the defense? Yes. And did you all were not given juror information, were you, Mr. Matthews? As far as your, you weren't given information that would allow you to reach out to jurors, nor did you choose to do so? Correct. Correct. Mr. Pete Meyer? Same And um, just for the record, Jurors had just as much right and ability to contact any media outlets that they wanted to talk to. So this notion that everything is being filtered by the court through the state or by the state or by the defense is totally inaccurate. Those jurors on their own chose to reach out to these parties and simply chose to not reach out to media. They had just as much ability. And in fact, the court offered assistance in that matter. No juror availed themselves of such, for the record. Ms. Diaz, go ahead. Yes, I haven't been to the uh, no surprise, we found the same cases that Mr. Grimer found. And but I do want to highlight So I'll get my IC back there. Okay, it's Rick. I think we're in place. We're not in a good spot. I can't show anything. Yeah, but they're going to take me, LJ. LJ, come back. They're All taking me. They're taking us. Okay. Can't step in front of the camera, sorry. I'll just talk. can talk if you need me to.
We were pushed back here from Tunnel Park and Neal Road. This is where the Lane Avenue garage is at. A Columbus person out we saw from the garage and they're questioning him. They have the canine unit there. You can see all of the SWAT vehicles from Columbus Police and from uh, the Sheriff's Office. And they are questioning a couple of people that they have brought out of the garage. You can see their these people are suspects or what. We just know that they have been evacuating this garage and we've seen dozens of people coming out. Um, they released those two young men to come out. Now we have seen at least a dozen people being brought out. We saw Columbus police and SWAT officers going in in full gear. So we're not really sure who or what they're looking for in this garage, but I think they feel like they have someone cornered in this garage and they're staying mainly here on the southwest corner of the garage, which is kind of faces Tunnel Park and Neal right across from the Blackwell Hotel. So we don't know a whole lot here other than they've pushed us back. Now they are patting down a couple of these people that they brought out of there. And as Ted said, we heard that there's possibly multiple uh, active shooters here, so they are asking.
prayers would be released and redacted for them. As I recall, you came out of the chambers, the jury was seated, you advised them that their, their questionnaires would be released and redacted for them. And I've watched them as you read that entry. And I've noted looks of terror and horror on their faces. We immediately went into we immediately went into evidence after the jurors were informed about the redacted questionnaires being released. And I'm not sure that any of them heard any of that testimony. We took a break at 11.20, as I recall, on that Friday. And at the, during the break, apparently Mr. Noel was informed that they were so concerned about the release that they weren't going to come back into the courtroom. And they, in fact, did not. They were sent home for the weekend to, to decide whether they would even return to come to work on Monday. Um, judge, again, I would, I would submit that, you know, not just for this case, where we assured the jurors their, their identities would be kept secret, but for cases in the future. Uh, it's going to be difficult, given the social media of the day, the 24-hour news cycle, and everybody just thirsting for something to report on the case, it's going to be extremely difficult to find people who are willing to come down here and sit in any courtroom as a juror. For that reason, I submit that the, uh, the arguments of both the inquiry and the CPO uh, are, are beyond what we should be dealing with here. We need to keep the jurors in Your Honor, I'm not going to add much more. It strikes me that there are two policy concerns here, whether or not the uh, individual privacy interests of the jury and uh, a risk of uh, injury to their person outweigh any uh, rights that the inquiry and WCPO have. And I think under Superintendent Rule 45B, you have sufficient evidence in the record to make that decision. And the second policy interest is whether or not we're ever going to be able to get a fair jury or an impartial jury in this county to retry Mr. Kennedy's jury trial in the order. And I think that uh, given the fact that uh, uh, names, information, and other things Very good. Thank you. All right. Having considered the uh, arguments made and the evidence offered, in particular, um, the court would consider the testimony of the court bailiff, uh, Timothy Knoll. Mr. Knoll testified through the proceedings that jurors had expressed reasonable concerns for their physical safety and that of their family members as a result of their involvement in this case. I would also go on to take judicial notice at the um, outrage and anger of our local community surrounding the facts of this case, the inability of the decision to reach a verdict and all other aspects of the matter. The case presented a unique question of law and State X Rel McClary versus Roberts, which is 88 Ohio State 3rd 365 and State X Rel Cincinnati Enquirer versus Craig which is 132 Ohio State 3rd 68, as well as the holdings of the United States Courts of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit in Calstrom versus Columbus, 168 F 3rd 1055. The main thread that runs through all of these um, precedents is the fear of individuals that their personally identifying information could likely put them in danger, thus implicating important constitutional provisions. I find that the jurors in this case have, and I'm quoting directly from Craig versus Calstrom, Craig, excuse me, Craig and Calstrom, a fundamental constitutional interest in preventing the release of private information when disclosure would create a substantial risk of serious bodily harm and possibly even death from a perceived likely threat so that such disclosure by the state should be measured under strict scrutiny. In reaching the conclusion, I've considered the applicable law. Superintendent's Rule 45E provides guidance to the court on the issues presented and instructs a court to restrict public access to information in a case document if the court finds, by clear and convincing evidence, that the presumption of allowing public access is outweighed by a higher interest after considering three factors. Number one, whether public policy is, is served by restricting public access. <clears throat> Number two, 
whether any state, federal, or common law exempts the document or information from public access. Number three, whether factors that support restriction of public access exist, including risk of injury to persons, individual privacy rights and interests, proprietary business information, public safety, and fairness of the adjudicatory process. The court also notes the balancing tests adopted by the Ohio Supreme Court in the State XRL Beacon Journal Publishing Company versus Bond, 98 Ohio State 3rd 146. In Bond, the Supreme Court held that a presumption of openness may be overcome by an overriding interest based on findings that closure is essential to preserve higher values in as narrow by a higher interest, specifically the constitutional rights of these jurors in light of the holdings in McCleary, Calstrom, Craig, and Bond. I find that this case is of a character in, in the community that incites passions regardless of the outcome of the case. For instance, the court will take judicial notice that Charlotte, North Carolina rioted after a hung jury in a similar case. Baltimore, Maryland, and other cities have rioted after verdicts in similar cases. I take judicial notice and find that the world has changed since Bond, and that the internet and social media make it easier for jurors to be found and suffer injury from their decisions. I find, as a matter of fact, that these jurors in this case were distracted by the potential that their identities would become known, and that the next jury in this case will have the same reasonable concerns. Now that I've made these findings, Superintendent's Rule 45E3 requires the, the court to apply the least restrictive means to them. Superintendent's Rule 45E3A provides perhaps the best example of how to, to achieve such limitation. The rule suggests, and I am quoting, redacting the information rather than limiting public access to the entire document. Therefore, pursuant to the court's statutory constitutional and common law authority, I order the clerk of courts to release the juror questionnaires redacted to prevent the jurors' identities from being made available to the press, the public, or on social media. Such redactions shall be made in the records released by the close of business tomorrow, which is November 29th by 4 p.m. It is so ordered. This hearing is adjourned. We're going to take a very brief recess.